We are extremely excited to have Dr. Sunday Cummins with us to really dig in deeply um, with the close reading of informational texts in particular. Um, Sunday Cummins is a literacy consultant and has been a facilitator on the New Schools Project for the Erickson Institute. She taught at National Lewis University from 2007 through 2012 in the reading program, and she also worked in public schools for 10 years prior to that as a middle school and third grade classroom teacher and as a literacy coach. Her book, Close Reading of Informational Text, Assessment, sorry, Assessment Driven Instruction in Grades 3 through 8, published by Guilford Press, helps teachers consider ways to transform and expand students' thinking. She continues to teach and learn alongside educators and students as a literacy consultant, author, and researcher with a focus on reading and writing informational text. She shares her work on the power of teaching with nonfiction text to transform students' thinking by presenting at state, national, and international conferences. And we're thrilled to have her here at our conference on the Common Core and really bring to bear her knowledge and wisdom about close reading and informational text. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Sunday Cummins. Am I on? Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for being here today and uh, coming back after lunch to uh, hear, hear this. Um, I think Michael just said everything there is about me. I do have a 10-year-old, so that's my other job, right? And last night she was complaining to my husband and I. Um, we had promised to play apples to apples with her at dinner sometime over the weekend. And I did, but my husband didn't. And she said to him, you know, I'm an impressionable young child. <laughs> and you are being a bad influence on me by not following through on your promises. So she keeps us in line. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, let's see, there we go, uh, close reading, which I think you uh, heard about with Tim Shanahan yesterday and has maybe been a thread of conversation through these two days. How to practice close reading um, ourselves as educators and with our students and what instruction looks like. So what is close reading of informational text? If you'll take a minute and find the handout on your table, it's about four pages. This is a, from my book on close reading of informational text. And just take a minute to read those first two paragraphs, defining close reading or describing close reading. So with this explanation in mind, let's engage in some close reading. This is a book called Frogs by Nick Bishop. Everybody familiar with Nick Bishop? Okay. Um, he does his own photographs and writes books, and he's got frogs, another one on snakes, another one on lizards. Children love these books. Um, I was so excited. I just visited a kindergarten classroom a few weeks ago. They were doing an author study 
Um, the first week was on Steve Jenkins, and the second week was on Nick Bishop, and then they were contrasting the illustrations with the photographs. Very powerful stuff. So in this book, Frogs, Nick Bishop works at revealing how frogs have many similarities, but also are very diverse creatures. Let me just read you a little bit of this, and then we'll engage in some close reading. Frogs are found on every continent except Antarctica. They live in ponds, rivers, forests, and fields. Some even live in sand dunes. The biggest, the Goliath frog from Africa, is as heavy as a newborn baby. One of the smallest, the gold frog from South America, could sit on the tip of your little finger. But big or small, frogs are always easy to recognize. Almost all have long back legs, a large head, big eyes, damp, stretchy skin, and no tails. So just in that first page, he begins to describe how they're widely different and how they're similar. A frog's eyes are large and quick to spot movement. Anything that wriggles is inspected. If it looks tasty, the frog gets ready to pounce. Most frogs use their tongues to catch prey. The tongue is coated with sticky mucus and shoots forward with deadly aim to snatch prey and toss it back into its mouth. Then the frog may use its eyes again, this time to swallow the prey whole. It blinks both eyeballs down toward its mouth where they help push the prey into its stomach. Now, did you know that? You learned one new thing today, right? right? Frog skin comes in every color and can even be see-through. Look at the insides of the glass frog in this photograph. You can see the heart that pumps blood, as well as the stomach and intestines that digest food. Frogs have organs similar to yours. Frogs have bones like you too, but not as many. While adult humans have 206 bones, frogs have about 159, so they are missing some. Frogs, for example, do not have rib bones. That is one reason they are so good at squeezing through small gaps, like between your fingers when you are trying to hold them. A frog's life is all about eating. Frogs eat almost anything that moves and can fit inside their mouths. Once an African bullfrog ate 17 young cobras, one after another. Some frogs seek out their food. A toad hops around after dark, snapping up moths, beetles, and crickets. It may eat more than 5,000 insects during a single summer. Other frogs ambush their prey. A horned frog hides among leaves on the rainforest floor in South America. It stays absolutely still day after day. When an animal comes by, the frog watches attentively, waiting until it moves closer. Then it seizes the prey with a loud snap of its huge mouth. The horned frog is not a fussy eater. It gulps down cockroaches, lizards, mice, and even first graders. <laughs> they fall for that every time. Okay, so. When I, choose, when I think about doing close reading with students, I think about choosing an excerpt of text that reveals the theme of the whole text or reveals, uh, gives content for grappling with the essential questions of a uh, unit of study. So if I wanted to really get at what Nick Bishop is trying to do in this book, I might read aloud the book. And then this is a text that I would pull um, as an excerpt to do some close reading. You have this at the bottom of the first page. Take a minute just to read it, and then I'll think aloud. Now, if you asked one of your maybe third, fourth, fifth grade students um, or a sophisticated second grade reader, tell me about what you just read, they probably would share the gist with you. 
Oops, sorry. This section is about how frogs like the toad and horned frog get their food. Okay, they get the, the main idea or the main topic, right? Um, how many times do your students, they read something and they come to talk to you about it with a book like this, right? Not open, not pointing to what they've learned, not sharing evidence from the text. They just tell you in general what they read. If we did a close reading of this paragraph, we might find that there's a little more going on than just comparing how the frog and the toad get their food. So let's look back line by line. A frog's life is all about eating. Now, that gives me a topic, all about eating. Okay, their life is all about eating. That's most of what they do is what I'm thinking. Frogs eat almost anything that moves and can fit inside their mouths. Okay, that gives me a very general, vague idea of um, their life of eating. Once an African bullfrog ate 17 young cobras, one after another. Now that's an interesting fact. Again, I'm not learning a whole lot yet about how their life is all about eating. So I'm going to keep reading. Some frogs seek out their food. Okay, now this gives me information. This is a way frogs get their food. They seek it out. A toad hops around after dark, snapping up moths, beetles, and crickets. All right, so that's how it seeks out its food. It hops around. It's after dark. It tells me when. It tells me what, snapping up moths, beetles, and crickets. It may eat more than 5,000 insects during a single summer. Okay, there's a statistic to support what the author has just described about how it goes about seeking its food, when, and what. Some frogs, let's see, I lost mine. Sorry about that, I lost my red on there. Okay. Um, other, other frogs, that's a signal word, right? So it means the author has been talking about frogs that seek out their food. When it says other frogs, then the author is signaling to me, oh, wow, there's going to be a contrast. He's going to tell me about a different kind of frog. A horned frog, okay, so not a toad, right, hides among leaves. Okay, it doesn't seek out food, so I'm already seeing a contrast on the rainforest floor in South America. He tells me specifically where. It stays absolutely still day after day. Okay. Um, it's getting at, you know, it's not moving around. It's staying still. When an animal comes by, the frog watches it tentatively. Oh, wow. It's going into a time sequence here or a sequence of events. It sits still. It watches and it observes, waiting until the uh, animal moves closer. Then it seizes a snake, uh, the prey with a loud snap of its huge mouth. So here the author has contrasted from the toad, which seeks around hopping, looking for um, different insects, with the um, African, the horned frog from South America, which instead has a very different way of finding its food. Um, it's, it sits still, it watches, and then it seizes its prey. In addition, the horned frog is not a fussy eater. Maybe he's contrasting with um, the toad, which snaps up insects. The horned frog instead may gulp down cockroaches, lizards, mice, and even other horned frogs. So there's more than just Nick Bishop con contrasting how the toad and the horned frog go about finding their food. What I might say after this close reading is the author is describing how the toad and horned frogs get their food. But he doesn't just give information about one and then the other. He describes these creatures' habits in such a way that I notice the contrast between the two. They are very different in how they get their food and in what they eat. I think this ties back to the theme in the book that frogs are diverse creatures. So what did we just do that aligns with Common Core? Which you probably have memorized and have been saying in your sleep, right? Um, we're working towards that reading, uh, reading informational text standards one and two uh, with prompting and support, talking about key details in the text, all right? Even in kindergarten, grade three, referring explicitly to the text as the basis for answers. Grade five, 
explaining what the text says explicitly and, and drawing inferences from the text. And then standard two, identify the main topic and retail key details. Uh, determine the main idea of a text. So it's, I think topic in kindergarten is still more than penguins. I think it's a little more complex than that. It's how penguins go about nurturing their young, all right? So um, it's, it's moving into uh, bigger ideas. And then in fifth grade, determining two or more main ideas of a text and explaining how they are supported by the key details. So we're getting at what does the author do to organize these details and convey their meaning. So how do I do this with students? Um, I can walk into any of your classrooms, probably, or your offices, and on your desk, there will be a framed picture, right? Think of a framed picture you have in your classroom or at your house. And if I walked around with that framed picture in your classroom with your students and said, tell me about this picture, they would say, oh, well, that's you know, Miss Cummins' daughter, Anna, and, and that's Anna's grandma Kay. And I, and I might say, okay, well tell me more. Well, um, that was when Kay came up to visit from Champaign and Anna's very close to Kay. And, um, and I might say, oh, tell me some more. Well, that's Anna's favorite blanket. It's full of holes and you can tell that they're close because Kay's got her head leaning down and her arms wrapped around Anna. And I might say, you know what? There are lots of pictures out there of grandma Kay and Anna. Why would your teacher choose to frame this particular picture with this particu these particular details? And they might say, oh, because they love each other and that was a very special time in our teacher's life, right? Okay, or they would know that it was your wedding date and, and that picture uh, reveals what happened on a very important day in your life. Or they would know that that's your pet dog who is beloved and spoiled beyond belief and, and your kindred spirit each evening. So this is a concrete way of getting kids into thinking about main idea and supporting details. Your main idea or the big idea in the book or the text is the frame. Now, um, you can, I, Nick Bishop, there's lots of books about frogs. All right, and there's lots of information about frogs, but Nick Bishop picked those details in a certain way and put them together in a certain way, including the photographs and the captions and the running text to get across the message of the diversity of these creatures as well as the similarities. So let's try it with another text. On the back of your handout on the first page, the back, page two, this is an excerpt that you might be using um, with a fifth grade class studying the American history. Let's say they've studied the American Revolution and uh, they're familiar with the documents that uh, came prior to the Constitution and now they're beginning to study the Constitution. Take a minute and do two things for me. Number one, read the whole text and stop and talk with your colleagues. What is the big idea the main idea in this text. What is the author trying to get across? All right, so do that first, about five minutes. Just what is the author trying to get across? You don't have to do a close reading, just do a general reading.
So the gist. What's the gist of this? Okay, talk with your, your peers. Write what I write. If you could see it, you'll hear me say it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so the main idea, or what you think is the main idea of this excerpt of text, is your frame. So what are you thinking the main idea might be at this point? Put yourself out there. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we're in trouble. It's dangerous right now, right? And we need a central government. Okay, so um, I'm going to put that, um, I'm going to build off that and say that um, our government was dangerously weak. And we need a central government that has more power, right? Now, when I model close reading with students, I make the text accessible. So it's on, a, on the smart board or on, when I was teaching, it was an overhead. Um, and um, or it's on the document camera. And in some way, they can see that text and they can see me working on that text and thinking through that text. So let's do that for ourselves right now. Um, let's look at the, at the title's first government. And the deck says, by 1783, the American Revolution was over. We know that, right? Because we've been studying this as fifth graders. So there's really not any new information right there. Or what we're doing right now is looking, if this is our frame, what are the details that need to be framed that support this main idea? The United States had won. We know that. However, our new national government was dangerously weak. All right, well, that doesn't really give us specific information, but that is where we're gathering our main idea from. Subtitle, Too Little Power. Again, does that give me a specific fact about how we had too little power? No, I, I'm already sensing that because we were dangerously weak, so I'm not going to underline anything. This national government had been set up during the revolution. I already know that because I've been studying this. It was based on a plan called the Articles of Confederation. We'd study the Articles of Confederation, so I have some background knowledge on that. It doesn't really tell me yet how my government is dangerously weak. It doesn't really tell me that we need a central government that has power. The Confederation was a loose union of 13 states. Okay, wait a minute, loose. That's like a red flag to me. So it's, uh, we have a Confederate government, I'm so sorry. Confederation. And this is the shared writing, or writing aloud I'm gonna do with students. And then I'm going to pull them into it. Loose union. The 
the state governments held most of the power. Oh, and I'm sorry, in this plan, the national government was weak. The state governments held most of the power. So I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put um, national weak on my notes. I kind of already have that, national government, dangerously weak. And I'm going to put state government, just to remind myself, power. Or I might be underlining it in front of students. The state governments, uh, the states wanted it that way. Ooh, that sounds like a power struggle to me. OK, I'm going to keep reading. They had just fought a war with Great Britain to escape from a strong central government. OK, so they want this power. Let's look at the next paragraph together. The Confederation government had so little power, it could not do many of the basic things a government needs to do. Take a moment. What would you underline as a supporting detail that gives you more information about what you think the main idea is? What would you underline? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so it could not do many of the basic things. I'm going to put federal government so I remember that. That tells me, that tells me in general why we were dangerously weak, why we needed a government with more power. It doesn't give me specific details, so I'm going to keep reading. Read that next sentence. What would you underline? Well, we already know that, right? The Confederation government is read by a Congress. We know that. It doesn't give us new information about what we think is the main idea. So I'm going to read on. However, is that a, jump, is that a red flag word? However. What would you underline in that sentence? No president to carry out the laws, OK? So no president. To carry out laws. As you read the next, par next sentence, you're already clicking, aren't you? OK, because we have a pattern here. No, 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 right? What am I going to underline? No courts. What else? What in that last paragraph, uh, last sentence, rather? Could not collect taxes. So it couldn't pay debt, right? Debts. Now, if I just stop and go, oh my gosh, what have I read so far that I understand so much better? I could say that, you know, when I first read this, I thought, okay, the government is dangerously weak, and we need a government, a central government that has more power. But as I read clo more closely, I realized that you know, the states want that power, but because there, there is no power at the federal level, they can't do a lot of things like paying taxes, um, settling disputes in the courts, carrying out the laws. So I want to read on to find out more details that support this main idea. So I'd, now I'd like you to read the next paragraph on your own and underline an example of this weakness. Now, notice an example of... That is a red flag for elaboration, all right? Which means it may not be um, another new fact. It may be explaining something that was already said right here. All right, so I'm going to keep that in mind. I'm interacting with the author and what the author is doing to convey the message. And he's saying an example of this. So read the whole paragraph and line by line underline what you think is important. And you may have to skip a sentence.
So when I read this, I thought, okay, an example of this weakness occurred near the end of the revolution. That doesn't tell me what the weakness was or what the example is. I continue on, a group of army officers was angry because Congress had not paid them or their soldiers. Ooh, okay, that's a problem, right? All right, and that goes back to not being able to pay the debts. So that's an example of not being able to pay their debts, what they owe their soldiers. George, uh, they were ready to march on the government and take it over. Okay, so this is like an effect, right? Here's your cause and here's your effect. So an effect is you're going to have the army march, right? March on the government. And George Washington had to step in. That's serious, OK? This is serious. All right. What I'd like you to do is that last paragraph with your group, what would you model underlining with kids or what would you want kids to underline based on this conversation already? We've looked at these first three paragraphs and pulled out details that support our main idea. All right, so take about three minutes to do that and then we'll wrap this up. All right, so let me, um, what I've just done is the gradual release of responsibility. I thought aloud with the first paragraph and modeled writing keywords and uh, phrases that support that main idea. And then I pulled you into that for shared note taking, reading, talking, and then I released it to you at the end. Does that make sense? Now. What I do with kids is um, they either can work from the page that they, and I'll share with you some artifacts from my instruction, but they can work from the page they've underlined on or they can lift those words out. And they use the words to summarize aloud first what they just read and respond to it, okay, to synthesize. So just like you saw me state the main idea and then what I was learning the de key details I was lear learning that supported that main idea, I want you to do that for yourselves right now. Pick someone at your table. They need to state aloud the main idea and then using their underlined words, you, uh, um, make a statement about what the key details are and how that conveyed the message. Does that make sense? Okay, so try it out loud for yourselves right now. What we usually do with students is we go straight into writing a synthesis, right? 
but it helps if they work on orally first, stating what it is they understand about the author's main idea and what it is they understand about the key details and how they support the author's idea before they write it. So try it out loud for yourselves right now. Good job. Okay. So, just from doing a close reading of this one uh, two-page spread in a National Geographic Reading Expeditions book, um, our students could walk away thinking, when we first became a nation, the national government did not have a lot of power, and this was a serious problem. What I didn't realize was that at that point in 1783, when the American Revolution had ended, we only had a Congress. There was no president to enforce the laws Congress passed. And some of the states were actually ignoring these laws. There was also no court system at the federal level, so there was no way to solve problems between states. The problem popped out to, the, the problem popped out to me was that the government had no way to collect taxes, so it could not pay money it owed to people like the soldiers who fought in the revolution. Plus, the states each had their own form of money, and this was really confusing to citizens who wanted to trade with others from different states. Just in this short chunk of text, the author has put together enough facts to create a picture of a nation that could fall apart 
if it does not get its act together. Your children, your students, we don't have to have our students do a close reading of every single page in the rest of that book. This is going to propel them forward. So that's one reason we do close reading is to really get kids deep into a text, start to grapple with what the author's central idea is or main idea, really see how the author is conveying this idea and the way they choose and put together supporting details, and then use that knowledge as we read the rest of the text. So what can we do to help students engage independently in reading the text closely in pursuit of synthesis? Just a little background on me. Uh, on me. I started out as a special education middle school teacher. Um, and I was fortunate enough to do a language circle uh, project read uh, training early on. So I kind of had a, a grip on what, how I was helping the kids systematically and sequentially. The problem with project read was that the, the, um, when I taught the kids informational text, I used all scripted reports that came out of the Project Read Manual, so they were set up perfectly for kids to identify the key ideas and supporting details. Then my kids would go to their science class or their social studies class and completely fall apart because they didn't understand how to read the more complex texts in those classes. So I set about looking at how can we take some of these systematic and sequential strategies and use them with the texts our kids encounter in everyday, in everyday classrooms and in the world. And so I'm going to share with you just a few of my ideas. Um, it, it, it's, it's, I, I could just talk about this for hours. I mean, we could go out for a glass of wine and I could keep you up to midnight. I just have so much to say about this. So I'm going to talk about it for about 20 more minutes. <laughs> um, so my first tip on the handout um, is to explicitly define synthesis. And um, this is the deal, is that I was coming of age as a classroom teacher. I had just started teaching. I moved from Austin, Texas, that's where the accent comes from, to Champaign, Illinois. And I was teaching third grade. And uh, what came out? Strategies that work. Remember? Mosaic of thought. We were all so excited because David Pearson had done this research, and he knew which seven comprehension strategies to teach, right? And so what did we do? September, you teach making connections. October, you teach asking questions, right? Am I right? Right? Chapter by chapter, month by month. In December, we visualize. In January, we make inferences. I am so darn tired after I said I didn't get to the chapter on synthesis. Oh, well, maybe next year, right? OK? So what happened was our kids were making connections. They were asking questions. Hey, you want me to fill in five Post-it notes? You want me to make five connections? I'll make five connections. I have a yellow raincoat like Paddington. I have a red hat like Paddington. I have red boots like Paddington. How many more did you want, right? And so our kids were learning about strategies and using them in isolation. And really, when you want kids to read a text and get deeper meaning, you want them to synthesize. And making connections is in service of synthesis. Asking questions is in service of synthesis. Visualizing is in service of synthesis. So a friend of mine, a colleague of mine down in Champaign and I did a year-long study with a group of third graders. And what we did was we taught synthesis at the very beginning of the year. And as the other strategies surfaced, children were using them explicitly or needed to use them, we, co we added those to what you needed to do to really get at the deeper meanings in a text. Um, and that's, and if, you, if you have old copies of The Reading Teacher, there's an article on that with examples of our student work in the March 2011 issue of The Reading Teacher. Or if you go to my website, don't tell IRA, you can download a copy. So teach explicitly teach synthesis using the frame um, analogy. And I have a definition of synthesis there. And provide opportunities to synthesize in written responses to text read aloud and then assess. So whether it's seventh or eighth grade or second grade, one of the first things I do is read aloud informational, non-narrative informational texts. So not the story of how the island saved the whale, but rather non-narrative gives, uh, it doesn't, it's not story-like. Does that make sense? Um, I read aloud these texts to students. 
so they can begin to develop an ear for what nonfiction sounds like, non-narrative informational text sounds like. Because think about it, our students have been immersed in stories for many, many years, whatever age they are. We tend to read aloud narrative stories. We tend to talk in narrative. Your students come up to you after lunch and the problem they had on the playground includes character, setting, conflict, and they definitely have a resolution they want you to, to implement, right? So I read aloud and then I ask them to write in response. And when I'm asking them to write in response and think during the read aloud, I use text-dependent questions. Now, there is, um, there are two ways to think about text-dependent questions, and Nancy Boyles has a great article on Ed Leadership. If you go to the ASCD website, it's in the December, January, just this last December, January, 2012, 2013. What she talks about is there's close reading with text-dependent questions related to the content that teachers develop, and the teachers ask the questions as the students read, and the students come to a deeper meaning of that text. So it might be specifically about the, um, what happened with the Constitutional Convention, okay? But when the child walks away, that close reading was reliant on your presence, all right? So there's, a va there's value in that, but they're not actually able to, they may not be able to articulate what you did that they need to do for themselves. So there's another type of text-dependent questions. Those are the questions, and Nancy Boyles talks about this in her article, those are the questions that students can begin to ask themselves over and over again with any kind of text to really get at close reading and digging deeper. So what is the author, and there's lots of them out there. For the purposes of today, we're pursuing um, close reading, in, our close reading is in pursuit of synthesis. So the main idea, what are the details that convey that? What is my response to that? What is the author's main idea? What is the author trying to get across to me, the reader? So basically, what is the frame of this text? What details does the author include to support her main idea? What are the details in the framed picture? Now remember, she has lots of pictures she could share, but she picked this particular picture. So, let's see. Oh, my, okay. So let me show what, share with you what I did with a group of fourth graders. They were studying um, habitats and how man influences the habitats of, um, the, uh, of nature, okay, and, and sometimes not for, not for the good. And so I came in and read aloud, the wolves are back. Now before I did this, I talked to them about the frame, and I introduced synthesis and that whole idea of the framed picture and the author's main idea with key supporting details. Then as I read aloud, I asked them to think about what is the author's frame and what are the details that she uses to, um, that are in her picture. So this is what one student wrote. Dear Dr. Cummins, I think this book is important because the wolf in the book, the wolves in the book were gone. Let me tell you what the book is about, my apologies. Um, and by 1926, in the 48 states we had at that point, all the wolves were gone, okay? In 19, and so what happened was a lot of nature, flora and fauna, disappeared uh, because nature was out of balance. In about 1995, we reintroduced 12 adult wolves into Yellowstone National Park. And it was amazing how balance, the balance came back. So that's what this book is about. I think this book is important because the wolves in the book were gone and when they came back, they helped a lot of animals build homes again and not be killed by the other animals. And it shows how important the wolves are to most of the animals in the park and how much they help the park. Once at my cousin's house, I saw a wolf chasing a, a squirrel. I don't know if the squirrel is still alive today. Okay. Now, in my book, I talk about every, for e each chapter that I teach on teaching, the first teaching chapter is about reading aloud, introducing synthesis and reading aloud and asking kids to write response. I have four uh, stages of development that I describe, exceeding expectations, meeting expectations, moving towards expectations. Oh my gosh, I forgot what the four were. Um, a, 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 yeah, exceeding, meeting, approaching, attempting. 
and I describe examples of what that might look like and give you um, ideas for follow-up instruction. So right here on page three in the handout, I've just pulled out the stages of development, meeting expectations for um, this chapter. And let's keep in mind, it's meeting expectations for a first lesson, all right? So it might vary. Your expectations might vary on this. Um, but when I look at this, um, I think that this student has a very literal interpretation of the author's main idea. The wolves in the book were gone, in the book were gone, and when they came back, they helped. Very literal interpretation. Um, I have to infer, as a reader, to some extent, that the wolves um, benefited um, the habitat and helped uh, the flora and fauna return. There's some evidence in general terms, so they. Um, so when she writes, they help the animals build their homes again and not get killed. And then there's some evidence of synthesis because she's grouped facts from different parts of the book and put them together instead of just going through in a list order. Um, this, is, this is what happened when we taught connections in a silo, right? Okay, I saw a wolf chasing a squirrel. I don't know what happened to the squirrel, right? No, it does not in any way help her understand the text better. And I think that's why, I mean, I think if you've read, I mean, if you've read Keen and Zimmerman, you understand that connections have to be meaningful. They have to help kids understand the text or they're irrelevant. But for some educators that have not read Keen and Zimmerman closely, it's just make connections. And that's the outcome. Really, the outcome is deeper understanding. Connections is how we get there. So um, that's, that, that's not working for that kid. This was another response. Uh, Dear Dr. Cummins, my, let me look. This is in my book, too. Let's see. It'd be easier to read in here. I think that the author wrote this to show children cause and effect. What happened when the wolves were gone, some animals came back and some left. Then everyone saw that we need wolves. They're part of the food, cha food chain. Without wolves, the food chain is off balance. That's why the wolves came back. When the wolves were gone, everything was out of order. Like when your mom isn't there, everything is out of order. She can't stop your brother from messing with you if you have a brother, or she's not there to make dinner. That's the same with the wolves. Now, that's a connection that works. Before I read this, I thought wolves were bad, but now I know that they are very important to wildlife. That's why the wolves came back. So what does this student do? She gets at the central idea. Okay, well, take a minute. Take a minute. Use the, the um, stages of development, meeting expectations. Just use this as language to not score the child or assess the child, but to describe what the child is doing.
Okay, so this student gets at the central idea in general terms. The author wanted to show the children cause and effect. And then in more thematic terms regarding how nature was out of balance. She gives some general evidence. Um, some animals came back and some left. Then everyone saw that we need wolves. What's missing are the supporting details, all right? So again, listening for those key details, which kids can do. We only have one copy of this book, but they can do it. So this is what I did. Um, I read through the students' responses and determined objectives for a follow-up lesson. I decided that we needed to work on using domain-specific vocabulary or more detailed terms, um, using specific details from the text to support our thinking, and then using theme-related vocabulary words to identify the author's main ideas. Our students do, a lot of the students I work with do not have the vocabulary to articulate synthesis. They don't have persistence, perseverance, tenacity, courage, in a deep understanding of those words to articulate what happens. So I brought in another book on the same topic. This was about a group of uh, a, a community in central Iowa that uh, rebuilt a tall grass prairie. And this book is uh, more complex and longer. What I did was I chose um, pages to put on the document camera so they could see the, the photographs and the maps. And then I chose excerpts to read aloud that I thought revealed strongly the author's main idea. So if you're working in the older grades and you have these longer texts, I specifically pull excerpts that I think work towards, the, that clearly illustrate the main idea. So after, uh, so what I did for the lesson, I'm just going to describe to you what I did for the lesson. I came in and we reviewed the frame uh, analogy and talked about what it meant to synthesize. And then I put up two examples of student work on the document camera at the beginning of the lesson. They love this. I always ask in advance, and they, I've never had a student say no. So I put up this student's uh, letter, and um, what I did was I read it aloud, and then I thought aloud about how I had gathered the central idea from the text from this response. Then I asked the students to give me specific words or phrases that identified the main idea, and I underlined them. It was a copy of her response. Um, and then, let's see, I had that right there. Then I shared this student's response. Dear Cummins, Dr. Cummins, I think the big idea is how the wilderness got into balance um, once, uh, got into balance once the wolves came back. Like it said in the text, the bison population went up and they stomped all the trees. The problem with that is the flycatcher and other birds needed it for nesting material and other things. I think personally that wolves not, are not dangerous animals because they don't harm humans. Also, if you take out the wolves, not only does it mess up the balance, but it messes up the food chain. I think the reason why um, Jean George, Craighead George, wrote this is because... Um, all animals are important. So I put this one up, and this is just briefly at the beginning of the lesson, and I talked about how she not only gave the central, uh, the main idea, but she also gave uh, specific evidence from the text, using vocabulary from the text. And I encouraged them to think like that as we read through this next um, read aloud. So what did I do? For 20 minutes as I read aloud, I would pause and reread sections with key vocabulary and ask the kids to tell me, what are key vocabulary words here that you might want to pull out or use in your reading response? And we listed those on the board. Then I reread sections and asked partners to recall with each other the details. So I would read it, and then I would reread it and say, I want you to turn and talk to someone. What are five things you just learned about how they rebuilt the prairie? Getting them to really not think about lunch while I'm reading aloud. Does that make sense? And then I introduced theme words like perseverance. So let's look at one student's response. This is what she wrote after the wolves are back, OK? So after the first lesson, she wrote, I think the author wrote the story so that people can understand how important wolves are to the wilderness. Wolves keep the wilderness balance. Wolves help other animals live. I also think the author wrote this story to tell people that wolves aren't always dangerous. They don't always harm people. 
And then in the side, you can see that she has wolves help the birds to get grass for food and nesting materials by keeping the elk population down. Wolves aren't that bad or dangerous. They are actually good for nature. So she, she works at the central idea um, in literal terms. And then she mostly discusses the central idea. This is what she wrote after the second lesson. I think the big idea of the story is that we need to bring back the prairies. We need to bring it back so that children can see what their land was once. I also think this because animals that were once there are now gone and we need to get them back here. It makes me sad that most of the animals left when the, prairie were, when the prairies were gone. Left when the prairie, I think the wolves were gone. But I was happy when all the people came to bring back the prairies. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong book. This is the prairie builders, okay, not the wolves come back. Um, <laughs> the prairie was destroyed and the animals left, sorry. Um, let's see. I mean, engineers, architects, biologists, congressmen, scientists, volunteers, and many more helped. I was surprised that all the people came. So there, she's, she's actually worked on two ideas. She's worked on what is the central idea and her response to that. And then she's talked about another idea of all these people came back to restore or rebuild the prairie. And then she goes into another idea. I was surprised that all the, these people came. I mean, I'm sorry. I also was surprised at what they did. They burned the land. I thought that fire is bad, but this made me change my mind a little bit. The fire clears away the dead vegetation and many larger woody plants. I hope that once more the prairies will be back. So you can see how she's, she's not just literally thinking about the, the theme and sharing some general evidence. She's really thinking through what the author has shared and responding to that to come to that bigger idea. Um, so I, I think one of the reasons I would recommend reading aloud first and asking kids to write in response is you take away the cognitive load of reading. And they just have to think about conceptually what is synthesis with this content that I'm hearing and writing that, which is difficult in itself. Um, this can happen in kindergarten. So I was in a kindergarten classroom and I read aloud Grandma Elephants in Charge. And if you, I, I love and adore this book. Um, and by Martin Jenkins, and it's about how the grandma is the matriarch of the family. She knows where the melons are. She knows where the um, salt lick is. She knows when there's danger, when you should charge, when you should not charge. And I ask the kindergartners, just in general, tell me something you think, uh, something that was important in this book, all right? What was important in this book, just to get an idea? This student wrote, elephants are very fun. Now, this is an aesthetic appeal, all right? And this is where they are, right? I love my mom, I love my dad, I love my sister, I don't love my brother because he hits me. Sorry, that was my husband's sister. Okay, and then you have, I like elephants because they have tusks. Now, this is important because this child is using domain-specific vocabulary. So there's a shift there. You want to nurture this. You want the students to write about a detail in the text, not just I love elephants. This student wrote, they can run faster than the fastest humans. That is non-narrative language. That student is on his way to writing, writing non-narrative texts and understanding and writing in response to non-narrative texts. And then this student wrote, elephants grow to be a grandma. <laughs> so you can look at how those are, the, each of those four students are doing something very different and coming to what is the big, what is the main idea, or what is the topic, and what are some details that help me understand that? Some are very much at that "I love you, you love me" stage, and others are further along, thinking about specific details and rewriting or writing those in their own words. Okay, I have three minutes, so I'm just going to uh, wrap up quickly. Um, there's a couple of things I. I the kids that I've worked with are usually striving readers, um, and I find that you can't just jump in and say, okay, let's do a close reading, because, you know, if, it, if it's Nick, and you ever walk up to Nick, and he's been reading, 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 and you say, tell me a little bit about what you're reading, and he gets this look on his face, and he reads the last sentence, and he regurgitates the last sentence. Do you have any students like that, right? So it, it takes a lot of work to get towards close reading. And I really think you need to start with reading aloud, 
discussing synthesis, having kids talk and write in response, and then moving towards close reading. Um, another recommendation I would make is teaching strategic previewing of the text, so using a mnemonic like thieves. But in all of my recommendations, you'll see that I, the teacher has to be fully engaged, fully present. We can't show up and do the KWL, what do we know, what do we want to know, what do we have to in advance have studied that text that we want them to closely preview or closely self-monitor for or closely think about the features and think and be ready to model for students. I share with you on that handout teaching self-monitoring, getting kids who are thinking about lunch to really be thinking about the text. And again, it's about modeling. Now again, you have students who will fill in 100 post-it notes, right? What do you do with all those post-it notes? Well, when you're self-monitoring, when you're thinking about what you do know and you don't know, what's familiar, what you have questions about, you're always thinking about it in pursuit of what is the author's main idea? What is the author trying to get across to me? So these are kids, they've put their post-it notes in the middle of a page and then they've drawn a frame around the edge and looked across their notes and written the author's central idea. And then we're moving them towards doing it on their own. So again, I tend to work with small groups. Um, and these are my notes from a text we did close reading on before my lesson. These are our shared writing. And these are the kids doing their own writing. And then this is a seventh grade class where I modeled and modeled and modeled and modeled. And we wrote out what we were doing strategically. And then I'd walk up to them and they'd say, what do I do? You have kids like that where you model your heart out? And then, and then they go to do it on their own like, what do I do? So we had them write on post-it notes what they were going to do. And then as I walked around to confer, I'd say, where are you in your close reading? And they'd tell me where they were and we'd go from there. Okay. Um, this doesn't have to be the end of our relationship. Um, you can visit my website. I have a blog. I love questions. Uh, you can email me. Uh, keep in touch with me. Keep the conversation going. Are there any questions right now, maybe? Burning questions? Oh, Michael, you promised me there'd be questions. A warm out. Mm -hmm. as a whole group. Eventually, do we change this approach to more of a small group and then maybe an independent level? Absolutely. striving to do? Because I guess I see that structure that, and maybe I'm dating myself, that shared, guided, independent structure that a lot of us have worked with. Right, group. absolutely. Is that the direction you're trying to take? So when we've done it as a read-aloud, then this is small group instruction, okay, okay. where they're working with a text. And I'm modeling, and then they're writing, uh, doing some guided writing and doing some independent writing. Okay. All right? And then another thing that I'm working on is, I mean, uh, when your kids do independent reading, how many of them are reading non-narrative informational text, getting more kids to read more nonfiction so that it's not so strange to them when they come to work with it? So good point. Okay, thank you very much.